This audio presentation of Conscious Immortality by James E. Dodge is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2012. All rights reserved. To those who seek for truth, I stood atop a mountain peak and saw reality at rest, the calm, the ease in which a million worlds sped on their way, faster far than one could think, a rest sublime and perfect harmony of movement seen, all in a fraction of a wink. Original Publisher's Preface this book has been pronounced a new step in philosophic and religious thought, giving the true breadth of the ethical and spiritual message of the Master, which is satisfying alike to scientist, religionist, or even the materialist. It explains why all our modern notions of time, space, substance, and spirit were anticipated in the true ideas of great beings. It explains who you are and what you can hope to know and be. Any human being who will take the time properly to understand this cosmology need never feel alone or helpless again. For the first time, there is given an analysis of prayer, which will satisfy both mystic and materialist. With these techniques in his philosophy, Dr. Dodds has been able to mend hundreds of broken lives and bodies. Even for the strongest and most self-sufficient, this book will be an education in the meaning of life and intelligence, why they appear and from whence they have come. Dr. Dodds is first vice president of the International New Thought Alliance. At present, he is also pastor of the Church of the Truth in Portland, Oregon, which he established there in 1937 a modern church suited to the needs of an analytical age, where special attention is given to the handling of personality problems and questions which arise in modern living. The answers based on ancient truth, particularly the philosophy of Jesus, have aided many individuals, and it is the basis and application of those principles which are explained in this book. Forward. The real light which guides man is not dependent upon the light which preceded it. Mental illumination is not dependent upon the concepts held at any one time or place. It is, therefore, not the purpose of this work to adjust itself to or harmonize with anything else in philosophy or spiritual science. This is a philosophy of intuition. The light herein contained was secured intuitively and is, for the most part, pure and original. It must carry within itself the power and the conviction of its worth. Those who have a bent for comparison may make them, but it is suggested that he who reads shall place himself in the position of one asking questions and then listening attentively for the answer rather than comparing the ideas expressed here with others he may have entertained. The mere fact that one is interested in such subjects shows a mind which is questioning and thirsty for such hints, ideas, or concepts that are useful in making possible a step forward. No honest seeker expects to find at once the ultimate truth, but rather so much of it is to provide a more positive approach to the ultimate. Progression is infinite. This work represents an intuitive release of a group of ideas which deal with man and his possibilities as a spiritual being. I have elaborated on some relative concepts in order to clarify the aims of our search. The reader is asked to examine each chapter carefully. By doing so, he will find that the ideas will come into harmonious pattern. Later, he is asked to read the chapter again from the standpoint of how it feels to him. A sympathetic reaction indicates capacity or readiness to accept an appropriate new light. Ideas which are presented to us, but a spur to personal effort. The truth needed by each individual must come as a pure certainty from the depth itself, and not just as something which denies or affirms what has gone before. Only what is really needed by the individual, at the level of his understanding, can be recognized and properly valued. To this extent, truth is self-evident. Those who have come to respect intuition will find happy response to much that is presented here. Those to whom intuition is a stranger will profit by the ideas, for among them may be found the light so essential to a quickening within of the spiritual forces. If we read with interest and expectation, we shall always be rewarded. From within the soul will come the approval. New ideas are frequently shocking. The degree of shock is the measure of crystallization of attitude. It is a sign of the need for more light. The search for truth necessarily leads to new paths of understanding and necessitates an integrity of determination for only the independent and fearless are privileged to break new ground. These enter into union with treasures of reality with alone quench the deep thirst of the soul and reveal new vistas of possible growth. The satisfaction gained through attainment gives one new strength to proceed. The student who remains young in attitude will remain more youthful in mind and body. In reality, the universe permits no tearing. The question is one of choice and growth, whether or not we are to press on to greater heights, gaining new strength with each new accomplishment. Only he wearies who has lost the way, never he who has the goal clearly in sight and feels the urge for new progress. The process is one of natural sequence and order. There is neither hurry nor lag. For the seeker in consciousness must not leave the state of poise and control. 
He is ever about the business of living harmoniously with new measures of eternal values, thus enhancing that portion of the endless days of spiritual light which are spent on earth. The reader is invited to enjoy with the author these aspects of truth given him, and to enter into that larger life of intelligent responsibility which belongs to those who know the way, who have gained the strength to walk therein. Chapter 1. Introduction to Thinking Real thinking is a creative function. Many have striven to untangle the ideas of man in order to ascertain which of these ideas arise from intuition, which from reaction to earth experience, and which from tradition and hearsay. But whatever we may think of the thought processes of the human brain, we shall all agree that its uses and possibilities are as yet unfathomed. Also we must recognize that somewhere between the universal which is innate and the explicitly expressed lies a mental realm which is creative. Unconcerned with what always has been, the thinker seeks to express a new aspect of truth, infinitely valuable offspring of intuition and reason, a little above the temporary wheel of things. This I am pleased to call real thinking. Creative thought is something we have always accorded to genius, though we deny it to ordinary men. It should not be difficult to prove that moments of illumination belong to all, though with most of us, at our present stage of development, they are a seeming accident, a momentary equilibrium, when the mists and fogs of earthly uncertainty drift apart, and there is experienced a moment of joy and divine certainty akin to ecstasy. Reason alone is but the servant of such an experience. I once had a student who described to me such a moment of her childhood. She told of walking through her father's orchard one spring morning. The trees were in blossom and the birds were singing. There seemed to be wings on her slippers, and even the flower pattern of the child's dress seemed alive and immortal. When old, she remembered every detail of bark and twig, a poignant memory, like an indelible photograph of the world wherein goodness and beauty reigned. Recurrently throughout her life, more real than the events which we speak of as really important, came the inspiration of this vision. Why? I believe because she captured in that timeless realization an idea of the victorious nature of the human soul. Surely this is touching the hem of the garment. Perhaps if we become real students of life, these experiences will become more frequent, at least for those who cultivate them. For I am certain we are fed according to our own call or need. Mind could have no purpose here unless it were to bring order where now reigns a tragic disorder of a plotless waste. Solomon and Shakespeare sense this, for it is a fiend of frustration that enrages a human soul. It is the picture of inadequacy both in the personal and in the national scene, in contradiction to all our inborn convictions that prey upon man to destroy him, body and mind, or mind, then body. For the real victories are those gained within, the occasional triumphs of purpose over dumb racial fumbling. The great performances of Man on Earth changes its stage lighting, let us say from candle to incandescent globe. But the drama remains much the same unless viewed with a detachment worthy of being so keenly aware of its progression as never to be overawed or confused. To find such illumination, we must adjust the focus of our mental sights to something which seems more remote, but is more real in the world of nature forms, in truth toward that shadowy something partially sensed in poetry, music, and meditative worship, which is near the essence and truth of forms. It is this understanding self that is the shaper of destinies, and to which we must hearken, the silent voice of the knower within, occasionally heard as conscious or as inspiration above the din and confusion of world mind. For it is this real thinker who is the builder and whose wisdom is divine. He it is who is at home in the great universe. It is he alone who can cognize the truth back of this drama of changing forms, and he alone who can introduce order and truth and beauty, where now are confusion and chance. So it is not natural to the vision of untutored mortal mind to grasp the universe other than by some process of illumination, some earned unity with true self. The present is one picture in a sequence appearing between the past of memory and the future of possibility, a drawing on the face of nature to be erased and redrawn to ever better proportions. Life will never be static. Neither is there a universal realm of fixed truth, for these soul builders will create the mosaic of life. What divine son, containing within his seed germ the unity of all duality, the power of both will and love, the combined inheritance of mother-father God, will halt his journey when the already at hand incomes too shallow an acquaintance, when an earth unit ceases to assimilate its substance, refuses to function, we say it dies, but there is no death for egos. Beyond the relational thinking of form life, there must be realms of realization requiring tools more delicately tempered, more subtly direct than any on earth. Into these it is not our purpose to probe, except to establish clearly the pattern of earth-man, and his earth-mind is a symbolic tool of the ego-thinker. This idea is worthy of our meditative consideration, 
For the egos are the units of creative intelligence, which compromise the power of the Holy Ghost, the Christ or Master Consciousness, which the historical person Jesus personified. Such are the sons of the body of God. Where man have failed is in the recognition of their ability, first in real mind or heaven, and in form on earth, to control at will the universal energy which is substance, the clothing as it were of ideas. All aspects of life are thinkable. This we have proved to some extent, even as we slowly and mechanically destroy in order to understand the forms about us. If there were no mental pole to the life forces which expresses in these forms, reason could never trace its processes or hope to build better ones. So back of inspirational thinking lives an ego, willing to express through a receptive intellect as God, is willing to express through his child. The destiny of man on earth is in the hands of those who will think. Life and religion cannot be separated, for a man's religion is his process of interpreting life. Those truly live who have a true religion. The doors of human freedom are just beginning to open. There are many doors just as there is in much ingenuity, but all lead to that unity which ever has been the dream of man. End of chapter. Chapter 2. Concepts of Man About Himself and God We accept the idea, which is the germ of Christian theology, that each and every individual is a unit of spiritual significance. We shall proceed differently in our philosophy and in our attitude toward life than if we do not. In fact, this is so vital a conception and contains such amazing implication that its significance is somewhat lost even to those who champion it most ardently. As we see him, man is a unit of earth creation and shares in its experience. The same sun shuns down on all, warming the earth, sustaining and feeding with its substance the plant and animal life, which in turn feed and serve man. Again in turn, man uses his creative abilities to care for and improve the species of plant and animal. As men observed the changes brought about in these forms of life and became aware of the processes of evolution and material law, it is not surprising that there should have grown up a general skepticism and the idea that man too was only an evolved animal which reasoned. But the peculiar function of the human mind, its self-consciousness, its creative perceptions, its quest for truth, and its sense of responsibility make this conception inadequate. The thought of man himself as an inconsequential thing outrages man's innate idea of himself, even without taking into consideration those cosmic experiences of mystics, saints, religious leaders, in fact of men of all time, which are too vital a part of human experience to ignore. Descartes said that the universality of an instinct justified belief in that to which the instinct points. He had reference to mankind's belief in its own continuity. Regardless of the degree to which the reasoning faculties may have been developed or used, men feel life to be eternal. Death is never for long a very real presence to the human realization, else life would be intolerable. As we search through the records of human thought, we find that the greatest of thinkers have allied themselves in mind with some inner fountains of truth some deep well from which inwardly they drew in part. Moreover, the contributions made by these leaders in inventive thought were recognized after a time by other men because of their intrinsic reasonableness. The ideas answered a need felt rather than thought of. They fit into a sequence of men's notion. After the first impact, all creative efforts which have produced ideas and objects are taken as a matter of course. In this sense, men may be said to be able to live time more creatively than they can think time. So while men in some respects behave intuitively as units of continuity, they have altered between many attitudes towards the good and evil in life, toward their creator, and toward their possible relationship to his universe. Some of these ideas have lacked consistency and logic, but that has not deterred men from following them. In our day, more than before perhaps, because of the emphasis placed on material laws of cause and effect, there is a general skepticism. The difficulty lies primarily in two things, the nature of man's reasoning, which even at best must proceed from a theory, premise or so-called fact, to a conclusion and the nature of truth itself. Unfortunately, there have been no complete and pure principles of truth available. Our knowledge has proceeded rather by a kind of accumulating consisting of partial truth, errors, and amendments. Each generation accepts the past, builds a little on it, and assumes that these findings are rather complete. Only now are men beginning to realize that this progression is a thing of possible infinity. All the primordial essentials or eternal attributes may appear in creation, in one way or another, but all of truth is not isolated in individual forms. There is a play of forces which Plato called the simply given. These are the invisible metaphysical or above physical laws. At no moment can any aspect of the universe be caught separated from them. Unconsciously, men search for these stable ultimates in a world of multiplicity and change. 
The nature of our knowledge might be illustrated by an example from history. Leonardo da Vinci left a memorandum which anticipated the airplane. Today we have airplanes, but their construction results from a combination of metallurgy, electrical science, theories of combustion and energy, and other technical developments unknown to the science of that day. Yet these were inherent in the realm of possibility all the time. The laws of their combination were always true, and again our airplanes, by future standards, may be judged to be clumsy and inadequate because of possibilities inherent now in the laws of energy or substance, which we do not at present see. Our reluctance to acknowledge this is a peculiarity of human thought. There are some basic attitudes among men which are of psychological interest. One is a tenacity with which we cling to the accepted notion of our time, country, community, and particular social group or family. These patterns of thought enter so subtly and become a part of the human reasoning so early that we accept them uncritically. We are not aware of them as fetters, sometimes not aware of them at all, or not until it is too late to modify our way of life. We make ourselves feel there must be right, even when they generate nothing but confusion. These are the mores, the race ideas, and they are largely responsible for the way in which the average person conducts himself. We like to move with the majority, the negativity of surroundings and ideas which men impose upon one another and upon their children makes life seem a terrible mistake for the most unfortunate. Moreover, at our present stage of development, where relative ideas rule more than ever before, and our civilization is more mentally, coldly competitive, many souls are too unaware of themselves to compete adequately. They are too inarticulate, too confused to do so. In the interest of our quest for truth, we must learn to lay aside a certain reluctance common to us all which makes us unwilling to examine opinions different from these we have always accepted. We are living in an age wherein change must be accepted. The physical barriers of land and sea no longer keep us apart. We must be willing to examine human beliefs honestly and dispassionately. What are some of the attitudes of man toward himself, his fellow men, his source? What about his religion? Are there any basic ideas acceptable to us all? Are not our failures due to the fact that we see through a glass darkly, and only in part? The thought of primitive people about these things usually takes the form of a belief in plural gods, of a good or evil disposition manifesting in nature. Having very little knowledge of the natural forces governing earth phenomena, primitive reasoners are inclined to propitiate the unseen by sacrifice, ritual, and appeasement. Their ideas of creation usually have to do with the direct act of an ancestor god, a special tribal deity interested in their particular group to the exclusion of all others. Strangely, all men, civilized or uncivilized, ancient and modern, regardless of their comparative worthiness, believe themselves to be definitely superior to others, the chosen of creation. Some even have this exalted opinion of their tribe or family. Any form of ethnocentrism is wholly indefensible. There are no pure races of men, and the sources are beginning of those who are known or lost in the obscurity of the past. Our own ideas seem best because they are usually the best as we know. But as Peter learned, God is no respecter of persons. Those who observe his goodness and wisdom are the acceptable ones. It is a peculiar paradox that in every social group of which we know, those most dominant in religious control have been the self-satisfied, who being quite well off in this world are only nominally interested in the next. These usually turn their energies to material accomplishment, and while they would appreciate a greater longevity with ease from pain and anxiety, still they feel God to be definitely on their side. They view religion as more or less a medium of social control. It is a part of their social and cultural inheritance. There is another attitude more often found among those on whom life has been rather hard, geographically, socially, racially, or physically. Theirs is another world frame of mind wherein it is accepted as a matter of course that this life, being limited, is bound to prove unsatisfactory. These usually turn their attention to freeing themselves mentally from their innate urge to express here more fully for these urges are the subtle shackles of the material world. Or they accept the promise of a richer life hereafter, and this enables them more stoically to do without here. This has been the philosophy of parts of the Orient, and was that of Europe during the Middle Ages. These people have accepted a law of negativity. Their God is indeed remote from earth life. Then there are the believers in divine intervention and revelation. For them, life is all a part of the plan arranged in advance. The plan usually requires a prophet or a savior, some specific divine intermediary, to right a world somehow gone wrong, through the deficiencies of natural man, or because of invisible forces of good and evil, which are divided into two camps, so to speak, and are battling over the possession of men's souls or ideas, and consequently over their destiny and their immediate lives. 
The philosophic problem of evil is thus explained away. Where the wicked have prospered, they have sold out to the forces of evil, which temporarily reign on earth. These are the determinists. Their God is the power for good, which in the end must win. Such souls as have accepted his plan will survive the Holocaust. Is it necessary to say that such a concept is too narrow to contain the ideal of liberty? Then there are the rationalists, believers in reason, ancient and modern, who believe in an impersonal way in the existence of another world, not because they feel a need so particularly of personal salvation, but because they believe in the things of mind and order, ideals of beauty, goodness, and truth. While obviously these ideals do not govern in this life, their presence even in part would indicate a realm wherein they have originated and do govern. These are the philosophers, the mystics of an academic world. They do not dictate to their first cause or prime mover what his nature may be, though they speculate on it in the interest of truth. They look, however, for a reasonable consistency. There are also those rationalists of another type, who, having found some of the laws which seem to govern substance, pursue their analysis of forms, hoping thereby to arrive at the basic substance or essence which comprises all life and forms. Their faith is that the impersonal methods of science the inductive method, will lead them back to first cause, or at least provide a thorough understanding of life. This type of reasoning has yielded such amazing results in a way of mechanical achievement and knowledge of the laws of atomic energy that it is quite understandable how it has developed a religion of its own. It is a sort of coming to grips with material realities and flourishes principally in the Western world. Some reason that man himself is but a biological sport of an evolutionary process. Some see life as a blind force, seeking to right itself from the general entropy inherent in forms by the evolution within itself of intelligent units such as men. Unfortunately, it is just possible that man may lose himself just where reason seems most efficient. Our mechanical devices may destroy more extensively than we can create. It has been said that the mind and body were made for practical three-dimensional occupations, but man does not live by bread alone. There are a great number of human souls who find abstract thought, particularly religious thought, too bewildering to cope with, but who would prefer a God of order and goodness, one who, having created them in one way or another, might be willing to help along a little with his wisdom and love. These expect to be helped from without. They are constantly looking to political power, social procedures, educators, or religious leaders to find for them the good life. They yearn for security and stability. Unfortunately, they are so taken up with the glitter or with the necessities of life that there is little time for personal critical thought. Perhaps if these were aware of the power of thought, they would be willing to give it a little more attention. But in the meantime, they pursue many formula for easy living, hoping to hit on the one that will work for them. Within but still without, this majority are the individuals who are antisocial or antagonistic toward their fellow man, toward society, or other people's idea of society persons who have little idea of unity. Some operate within the community under a veneer of respectability. Others become such social problems that they are placed away in institutions. Some operate as brigands in the international scene. Each has his own idea of order, but it has little to do with the God of love. Down through the years, stretching into countless ages, this vast army has struggled along the highway of life. The thoroughfare seems to have been a little narrow in places, and men thought it necessary to show a great ruthlessness towards one another to practice policies of exclusion, exploitation, or deliberate conquest and destruction. It seemed easier for them to destroy than to find new and broader ways and means of living together. Here and there a light has flickered, where some mind disciplined to thought and selflessness, searching for truth, has widened the road somewhat by supplying men with new incentives, new ideas of beauty, has added hope and significance to life or made possible devices and means for better and easier living. There is in us a peculiar reaction to life wherein we accept the material existence as a thing complete in itself so long as circumstances are pleasant or tolerable. Only when personal loss, disorder, or disillusionment overtakes us do we turn our attention to any ultimate good. Only then do we become, even to a limited extent, a citizen of the universe. Only when the haphazard, the physical, and what we fondly imagine to be the practical desert us do we begin searching nature and mind for some underlying principle or code of procedure. Perhaps then we idealize a heaven in some unknown place where all is order, peace, and beauty, wherein we can abide without effort or thought. Unthinking life is not and never will be sufficient for man. He desires to express his own innate urges and capabilities because he is a creature of progress and idea. It is the manifestation of what he thinks that comes to life in his world. It is naive to suppose that the outward things come first. 
Man is by nature selective, and his history is a picture of what he has chosen to express. His lacks are the outward symbols of possible choices, which he has neglected or abandoned. Ideas are a force. Each becomes what he has chosen, due to one influence or another, as being important in life. Relative ideas have temporary power, and real ideas are a spiritual force. Consciousness is a deterministic factor in the universe. There can be no lasting unity among men, no successful society, until there is a unity of allegiance to some basic principle or ideal of life. Mankind is confused, living in a world of shifting values and incomplete notions. Man in general is ruled by fear, prejudice, and uncertainty. Each individual follows the working out of his own order as best he can. Each seeks, perhaps, in a hostile environment to express his type, fulfill his dominant urges, and to leave his mark upon the world. Religious philosophy must take up its role as the great unifier of all systems of thought and teach an approach to living from a standpoint of unity and harmony. The sole justification for thought is to create a better understanding of life with wisdom to proceed intelligently with the universe. To understand life as it is conceived in this study, we must alter our view, if necessary, to see man and his mind tool as a unit, the outer mechanism of a more extensive power. The fact that these truths were attained through unusual and personal experiences will have no bearing unless they can be understood, believed in, and used by others with some practical efficiency. End of chapter. Chapter 3. The Nature of Man's Becoming or Creation All things are an expression of the undifferentiated, universal no-thing. Each thing is because of something else, and that something else is an active force. This vital force, acting from within the invisible primordial substance, is the source of all creation and form. These forms are possible because of a natural affinity which exists between the plus and minus of a Thomanistic substance. The ever-active, infinite divine or universal no-thing is in a perpetual state of becoming or begetting. Each begetting constitutes a temporary chemical unity attained within the whole. This might be said, by relative comparison, to be the sex function of the universal, being male and female, together the perfect whole. This duality and unity is normal to its functioning. The two aspects of the universal force united in creation might also be said to be those of wisdom and love. Wisdom being the timeless source of direction and order, and love being that of attraction or cohesion, the physical pole, without which even the temporary forms would not be possible. Because of its inherent creativity, the universal attains an active self-expression by producing forms. These forms fall into the categories of manifestations, such as fish, trees, animals, planets. Exhibited in the categories are certain qualities, the variety of opposites, big, little, tall, short, loud, soft, sweet, sour, tender, strong, rough, smooth, hot, cold, which are basic to creation and constitute its interest and variety. Consciousness is appreciative of these qualities. Each unit of a category contains within its germ the urge to be what it is destined to be. In moving into fulfillment, each is in unity or agreement with the growth of its own category. It fulfills its own potentialities, no other. These units are not self-conscious, but they have an instinctive behavior by which they fulfill their purpose. In fulfilling their purpose, they have spent themselves, becoming depolarized, they disintegrate. The substance embodied in them is released and returned to the universal atomic field, where it awaits the call of an active idea or another seed germ. The all-inclusive, non-temporal nature of the divine no-thing is both the creative force and the material out of which creativity is carried on. The creativity of the universal is without a precisely fixed character of form or relations. Categories gradually change and evolve. No two leaves are alike. But because of natural chemical affinities within the substance, as well as the potentials contained in the seed germs, the designs might be said to have a certain probable determination. Creation, then, from cosmic cloud to the smallest cell, is a procession in time and space of a like yet unlike recurrence or reappearances. All manifestation shares immortality and that it is made up of universal substance. Its source is eternal, even though the world of form is never twice the same. The forms might be said to be eternal in the sense that under like circumstances they could recur. The universal supports and contains the essence of all that is, though the time may have been when it had not divided itself into what we now recognize as creation, or particular and individualized expressions of the infinite. Illustration we know that in the atmosphere of our own planet, moisture is condensed to form clouds. Clouds, in turn, may become rain. They also may contain the possibilities of an electrical storm. Both of these can become very active and put on a positive demonstration, yet we have not been able to see the workman or that which produces phenomena. 
the whole occurrence is an example of the flux and change in universal energy. A certain crystallizing activity takes place under pressure in the earth which produces diamonds, rubies, all precious stones. Another activity within the primordial process produces gold, silver, and all precious metals. Others, too, we might mention, but this is enough to bring about the fact that at certain times, under certain definite conditions, local and cosmic great changes take place and one element is transmuted into another, or these are combined into new forms. Whether it is a diamond or a sun, all forms represent an unseen active force manifesting objectively in categories of life and substance. The whole process is one of sequence and multiplicity, the emergence of the visible from the invisible, a series of cosmic birth. We realize then that the great creative force which produces phenomena is an unseen, unconscious, acting force, and all creation as we know it today was a product of similar action. In a great, self-purifying chemistry of the universal at certain periods, such a combination of unseen forces could produce one category of manifestation, such as a sun or earth, at another time water, at a later date fish, later still birds and animals. Each of these following in succession according to a chemical progression of creation or manifestation which is inherent in the universal. Thus the activity of the creative force carried out the seven days of creation, days meaning active periods, and produced the categories of life preceding the divine man or ego. All categories are the product of the universal acting within itself, and while in themselves they are individual nevertheless, they contain the universal character of a common unity. They fit into the organism of the whole. Life on earth is energized from the sun. The sun is part of a larger system. This is the principle of relativity or mutual dependence incidental to form manifestation. It is a natural and unconscious unity. There is always interrelation and mutual service of the parts. Fly above the earth and you will see an infinitude in unity, an indefinite number of things reacting on one another to maintain the earth environment. In the instinctive behavior of plant and animal species, in their unconscious adaptation and appropriation of their life needs, we see aspects of the universal resembling intelligence. There are many such aspects in the categories of manifestation which proceed out of the universal. For instance, a snowflake may be and often is a thing of rare beauty, yet it is not a product of a conscious thinker. One of the laws of the universal governed here and certain elements were combined by laws of attraction to produce a snowflake. Subject the snowflake to heat and it rapidly loses its form, or its substance may be dispersed through other forms after the law of mutual service. It may, as water, nourish plant, animal, or even man. Certainly the snowflake did not take form by its own conscious act. Its having been given form for a moment and made visible was part of an unconscious chemistry. A law of the universal carried out the entire function, but without knowing that it had created a snowflake, without even being aware of its own self as an active agent. The process and the result can be appreciatively cognizized by the ego's relative instrument man. Material science judges substance to be a grouping by chemical affinity of primordial negatives and positives in a variety of ratios, neither the negative nor the positive being sufficient in itself. But the nature of the universal is in another sense dipolar. Having a mental pole and a physical pole, it may in some instances of time act as a material for an organ of perception or thought while at another time it may be reassembled and used indifferently as material for some unself-conscious form, such as a bit of mineral or the petal of a flower. Each of these has a certain sensitivity, but of a somewhat different order. The difference in the significance of use of the universal material lies in the creativeness and the self-consciousness of the thinking man, who is a tool of the ego. The potential ego, which I call the seed of divinity, is the highest peak reached by the universal in its begetting. The universal substance, by its own interactivity, condenses into or manifests as egos. The number brought into being at any one time is a question. At what time or times this takes place would naturally depend on the arithmetic of the whole, though it would be an orderly procedure and the actions would take place in sequence. Each ego is a unified, individualized expression of everything that preceded it and contains within itself the possibility of exhibiting all the divine potentials. In the primordial universe, activity is unconscious of itself, but God-nature is eventually realized in the thinking of egos. Self-consciousness belongs only to them. They are, therefore, a new measure of expression in that they have intelligence for their portion. In the ego, the universal has evolved a self-consciousness, self-determined, intelligent, self-sustaining, self-motivating unit which stands superior to everything that preceded it in creation. 
These egos in their natural growth constitute eventually the highest form of expression in the universe and become the gods or thinkers, the rulers of all creation. God enjoys conscious, objective immortality through them. The urge or thirst within each ego for complete realization of the divine potentials within himself conditions its creativity. Egos build from universal substance as units of intelligence and think what concerns them. The aspects of God are realized and framed into ideas through the thought processes of egos. The egos are externally free, their development being determined only by their potentialities, which are of the infinite. Their growth or becoming is by a process of intuitive knowing and a gradual attraction from the universal of the chemical essence of form, corresponding to the divine potentials being developed within themselves. No aspects of divinity is inaccessible to an ego. This lifts its physical pole, relative man, to a position of sonship, as demonstrated in the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. The Son of Man is the only unit of creation in the form world, capable of value, appreciation, and creative choice. But the ego conveys the will of the Father, because it alone is capable of non-relational, pure, and decisive intelligence. This is the meaning of the assertion, to do the will of Him that sent me. Therefore, truth for each man must be intuitively cognizized. Each must find his own good, the truth of himself, and realize his own potential. All that is untrue in the world is merely a misinterpretation of the true. The temporal errors are but the choice of the material mechanisms. They are exerting forces in reverse, so to speak, multiplied by a minus rather than a positive. These errors take place when the ego's instrument of expression in the dense or mundane plane, the reasoning man, takes things into his own hands and endeavors to operate independently of that upon which he is dependent, the spiritual ego. The waywardness of the relative mind is symbolized in the character of Satan. All religion is for the purpose of returning this objective, negatively intellectual, emotional renegade, physical man to his true government. The true government is a law by which the real self, or the real rather than the relative false ego, manifests in a physical body on earth. This law we know in the Christian religion as the Lord or the Christ, the divine principle, which is the way, the truth, and the life. When the erroneous man has been redeemed by his interest in and love for the reality of himself, as symbolized by Christ, he may become an illumined being, ascending to higher levels of unfoldment, entering into finer and yet finer phases of expression, finally rising to the point where he, through his own development, transcends limitations and finds himself master of all that concerns him. Our earth might be termed a grade in school, when where the pupils are just beginning to evolve character. With mastery of themselves will come mastery over substance, as Jesus demonstrated. It is because of this exalted accomplishment that the greatest beings in the universe are those who have once been men. Although we recognize, too, that there are many beings who occupy certain realms and enjoy much freedom, who as yet have not taken upon themselves the limitations of an earthly body. Because of this, they remain members of uninitiated groups, but eventually, when their time comes, they too will undertake the experiences which lead to individual mastery. End of chapter. Chapter 4. The Ego, the Real Thinker The ego is a spiritual man. It is a unit of consciousness or pure intelligence. It is not a mind with a body, nor a body with a mind, but it is homogeneous. Whole consisting of the pure essence of the mental pole of the universal, each ego is a being of light. I make no apology for this description, unusual as it may seem, for it has been my experience to see them. The particular nature of the universal aspects or principles, which each individual ego has chosen to develop within itself, are reflected in the color and quality of that light. This might be termed the rate of frequency or vibration. In the spiritual world, the egos are known to each other by the living garment of light in an absolutely pure sense, not possible to men's knowledge or one another in the physical world. Here we usually judge by outer correspondence and qualities, and only occasionally by a feeling intuition of one another's inner qualities, which is near the truth. Egos in their world are drawn together into groups, just as earthly men are, by a feeling sense or consciousness of kind. In the realms of pure thought there is no inharmony, because the beings there do not think of part of truth as mortal man does. They do not adopt ideas which must later be discarded. They do not think about things, rather they think things, or the truth or essence of things. For that reason, there can be no differences of opinion in that heaven of consciousness, no conflict any more than there is disharmony between the vibrations or wavelengths which comprise the light that we see reflected in colorful nature. The divine aspects in a pure state complement each other. Where this kind of order does not prevail, there is no permanence of form. 
The dissolution of temporal forms is therefore part of the purifying action of spirit within the universal, a breaking up of tensions. Only the principles endure. Forms as we know them are not worthy of immortality. Their indefinite continuity would clutter the earth and crystallize creation. Life is a process. Egos are what they are because of a law which operates throughout the universe. This law is that each thing attracts to itself the substance corresponding to its nature or need, in order for it to be what is intended to be. Plant life needs plant substance. Animal life needs animal substance. Each organ within the animal attracts its own substance. Nerves appropriate the substance that will make nerves. These all consist of the primordial substance of the universal, but for each manifestation it is grouped differently. At a little different rate of vibration to suit the function of the unit, each ego draws to itself the pure essence of the universal corresponding to its internal nature as all form life does. But intelligence and pure creative decision might be said to be the very meaning of the ego. An ego is the seed of divinity experiencing self-realization. The spiritual ego, moving and growing in universal substance, by means of its own will, attains new experiences through its yearning for the completion of the God aspects within himself. By this process it builds new measures of soul growth. This growth has permanent value, for no real thinking needs to be done twice. These egos, or Christs, are the units of responsibility in the universe. But the idea cannot be accepted that they are unchanging souls enduring change in physical bodies. The egos do change and grow, not, however, by discarding a part of their thought substance or consciousness, but by developing more and more aspects of the divine in their inward constitution. To each of these aspects of the divine, the egos add their own natural and individual color or influence. In this sense, God's nature is not only realized, but enjoys a new creativity through the function of these units of intelligence. The possibilities of these ideas which belong to the creative advance of our ego far transcend the temporal or earthly ideas of men. They can only be compared to the free imagination of the creative geniuses on earth. In fact, these are the flowering of ego aspects, possibly because, in some men, there is a discipline of the human mind which permits their own reality to pour through from the truth of being. In these instances, there is a focalization of the entire mind in person to one purpose. We call this concentration of interest genius. The ego is the real man, the God-man, and all true work is progressiveness is done by the ego. The will of ego is the will of the Father. It contains the divine harmonies. No other will can serve here, that which is in accord. The Son and the Father are one. There is but the one will of God. It is not and never can be a thing of divided opinion. It muses function through pure units of intelligence, and these are the egos, the Christ or the Son. These are the Father in action in the universe and through regenerated man on earth. Because of the Christ principle within himself, man is significant. He is powerful when he has established a unity within himself of the inner and the outer, when he makes of himself an unobstructed channel for consciousness. All great progressive changes are the result of the intuitive vision and initiative of this group of beings as yet little noted by the people of earth. The real Son, Christ, is the Father's expression, and the Father is perfectly able to take good care of his own. The sons of God constitute the household of God and are the heirs of the kingdom. As these sons, or infinite gods, become more and more self-conscious and develop understanding, each takes possession and direction of his kingdom and expands it. Each evolves by development of his awareness and understanding of who he is, what he is, and what he is to be. Being potentially able to absorb and exhibit in himself all aspects of the mother-father God, both masculine and feminine principles, this thinking, growing Christ, is the most precious unit in the universe, one that is eternally secure. I and the Father are one, declares the Christ. The ego never knows lack. He is never absorbed as his relative counterpart is, with the material show of forms. His understanding is of the essence of things, and he has the power and inherent capacity to appropriate whatever he needs for his purpose. Since he is prompted by his inherent urge to grow, and is in perfect accord with the wisdom and love, or idea and form, principles within the universal, his movements in consciousness are always productive of the needed good. This self-conscious, individualized, spiritual son always stands in the center of the universe insofar as he is concerned. For wherever he is, through the power of love, joy, and appreciation, he calls into being whatever he needs. His need is a guarantee of supply. Whatever he needs, needs him, and will find him. By each action of his will moved by love, union is established within his being with another aspect of his good. 
He has taken a step never to be taken again. This is true thinking, real movement in the infinite. It is accomplished by the real man and is reflected by the temporal man in proportion to the man's attitude of mind and his willingness to cooperate with the eternal principles. End of chapter. Chapter 5. Consciousness. In order that we may understand the true meaning of consciousness, it might be well for us briefly to review the way of man's becoming. The instinctive, emotional relative man is because of soul. Soul, the garment of understanding, is because of ego. Ego is because of the seed of divinity. The seed of divinity is because of the special function of the universal infinite divine, the force which activates primordial substance. The seed of divinity, being the highest form in which the universal expresses, contains within itself not only the essence of all things, but also the potential capacity to understand, and by understanding to have dominion over all things. Through egos, the universal moves from instinctive acting to self-realization, and by this action produces within itself intelligent and articulate units, master workers in substance. The more highly evolved egos undoubtedly possess those attributes which the most intelligent of men have attributed to their god or gods. Our task is to examine carefully this process and so familiarize ourselves with it that we may become the conscious expression of all that is inherent in our natures. The seeds of divinity in their beginning are small, very bright, scintillating lights. These seeds are potential egos. Great numbers of these seeds are brought into being at one time. The number which come into being at one time constitute a group. How large these groups are and how frequently the universal manifests them I cannot say, but I do know from the experiences which I have had that they are brought forth in groups, that they develop in groups and travel along together. No doubt in earth life the group characteristics appear as racial distinctiveness and cultural trends. In the creative process which has produced these seeds of divinity, there can be no error, because everything that is created is a result of chemical affinities. The undifferentiated universal does not think, neither is there within it an agency which schemes or notions of its own. Its actions are what might be termed a chemical nature, for want of a better term, and in this activity there is no room for error. The process of one of impersonal law and acts accordingly, it cannot do otherwise. If we have this principle clearly in mind, we shall then be satisfied that the background of being is a truly acting field of life. While this field of life might be said to condition manifestation, it does not actually determine it, as it appears in physical detail. It must be obvious that no particular quantum of energy is in any one place in the universe other than by laws of probability. Atoms have no appreciable freedom of action. Though they are subject to laws of molecular reaction, their position aside from this is one of chance. Every environment, such as a planet, moon, or sun, has its own rates of vibration, its own pressures and temperatures, which govern the molecular reactions in that environment, and to some extent determine the kind of life that will appear there. However, there is but one substance which, having an activating pole and a physical pole, we shall name primordial energy. This substance appears in forms which exhibit the aspects of its mental pole. These aspects are active principles. When exhibited in nature and found by a thinker, they resemble purposes. When reduced to idea in the process of real thinking and acting, they have purpose. A principle, as here intended, is a group of universal or primordial potentials, carried in the life force and grouped together by a chemical activity or process of manifestation, which is ever taking place in the infinite primordial substance. Its operations are confined, necessarily, to the limits in number and nature of the potentialities contained within itself. As far as we are concerned, the possible combinations of these are unlimited and beyond imagination. But these potentials are the universal aspects, laws or principles, sought out of itself by the intelligent units or egos. From these aspects, egos build soul or consciousness. A potentiality does not become idea or a part of mind or consciousness until conceived or understandingly grasped by the thinking ego. The ego, by its thinking, takes hold, so to speak, of its own potentiality and transforms them by means of understanding into ideas. We may say, then, that mind is a result of the action of a thinking unit or thinker endeavoring to be himself. Man is a thinker who, by his own thinking, as an extension of the ego, has created a mind, a mind condition. He is primarily because of ego, and ego build consciousness. Their consciousness is of their own making, a product of their reaction from an integration with their own experience. This mind is private property, it belongs to ego, and is the objective man's, or your source of truth. 
By this conception, there is no universal storehouse or reservoir of truth. There is not a presiding intelligence, manipulating or using the intelligence of men or of egos. Any instrument for the conception of ideas, such as a man's brain matures out of the universal, as all things do, by the same laws of chemical affinity that govern in all manifestations. What is sometimes called divine mind is an aggregation of ideas produced by thinking units. There is no universal source from which ready-made ideas are drawn. Ideas are a product of thinking beings who have potentiality for thought. A Beethoven sympathy is Beethoven's gift to man, his consciousness of music reduced to idea, and not something captured from thin air. All intelligent action stems from the universal in the sense that creative ideas employ universal potentials. In a sympathy, these potentials are laws of vibration and harmony. If the universal had no mental pole, it would lack such potentials, and there would be no minds to grasp principles and use them creatively. The mental pole of the universal is evident in many forms of life, where it is implicit and instinctive. Man is more highly integrated because, as an extension of ego consciousness, he can entertain explicit ideas and make them articulate. Consciousness is the ego's powerhouse. The value of the consciousness and of the whole being is the measure of that which the individual ego has lived or thought. All life exhibits some potentials of the universal, but there is only one category of units which is infinite in all direction. The recognizing, conceiving, and fertilizing aspect of the ego constitute will. The will consists of both negative and positive, plus and minus, masculine and feminine principles, and is the perfect acting alchemist. It remains eternally young because it is in the process of eternal growth. It lives spontaneously in the instant, potentially able to have whatever it needs at all times. But its whole process of being or becoming, or living, is one of intuitive thinking. It is not interested in appropriating external things as its relative instrument. Man is, though it may conceive them, its process is creative. Thought came with egos, not before, and the thought of an ego is a perfect piece of work and therefore eternal. It does not appropriate ideas and then, finding them inadequate, discard them. Its thinking is in harmony with the laws of creative action. Because of ego, the universal potentials are brought together by the call of will, and the process is a harmonizing one, a balancing one, one of love, the will of the Father. The philosophy of Jesus was built around this concept. Since the aspects of God are the sole material of real thought, the man as an ego must handle these in form of idea. The unity of man through reason, governed by love or sympathetic understanding, must be a conscious certainty. Anything less than this, Jesus declared to be a structure built on shifting sands. All growth and hence all life functions in the realm of reality, for it is an instinctive reaching for and feeding upon the substance essential to its maturity or satisfaction. However, there is no such thing as actually dead substance. It all manifests energy even when we see it as inorganic units such as earth or rock and believe it to be dead. Even these have a certain chemical consistency and character. They possess a rate of vibration consistent with the way in which their basic substance has been arranged. Our knowledge has classified these inorganic units by name as elements or minerals or combinations of these. They are a vast storehouse of energy and together with certain energies derived from the sun and perhaps from yet unclassified sources, they provide the material for life. When we speak of living things, we usually refer to organic entities in which the life principle is still operating. While the life principle still is operating, the body is drawing from the universal storehouse and is becoming something more than it has been. It is continuing to obey the urge to become what lay in its seed germ as a potentiality. The patterns for these potentialities lie in chemical genes. They attract to themselves a substance in keeping with their inner principles and evolve into manifestation. Some life forms have risen to a point of development not adaptable to earth condition. Due to this or some other inadequacy, they have become extinct. Man can bring about the extinction of species, even perhaps of his own, by artificial or physical methods. But the faculty of dealing with life at its source, through idea, is a faculty of the ego. This is the omnipotence of thought, which has been attributed to legendary characters. It is the basis of the miraculous, such as spiritual healing. Through idea, men too are learning to control nature. But theirs is a relative capability. It consists of breaking down and reusing substance already at hand. For example, I have before me a table. The table is not now a living thing. Once it was activated by a living principle called life, we classified it as a tree. Its substance was united under one control. It was living and growing, drawing its substance from the universal by way of earth, sun, air, and light. 
Man has made this table after a pattern originating in his sense of values, his idea of utility and artistry. But the things which man makes are up to the present dead things. They do not live or grow. There are thousands of these things that men value on this plane, but they are purely relative. Such things have materialistic value only. They are of no use in the realms of actual consciousness, but they serve their purpose, and they are because physical man feels he needs them, and they are a product of his relative thinking. They are not a product of spiritual thinking, and spiritual man has never depended upon them. They belong to earth life, and even though they seem necessary to us, we must remember the earth is only a fragment of the cosmos. It was to this relative nature of man activity and custom that Jesus referred when he answered the Sadducees. They were wondering about the social status in the resurrection of the woman who had married seven times. Jesus answered, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But in that world they neither marry nor are given in marriage, for he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. So even the social concepts which seem necessary to us, Jesus labeled as relative, related to earth life. The things of Caesar, with one exception, the social principle of cooperation for good, as against evil or destructive ways by which life principle is frustrated. The real of man fellowships with living principles only. The ego does not destroy in order to build. The ever-living God resides in the world as a transcendent principle of life transcending his own substance, just as a noble man transcends the merely physical aspects of his form. An ego is a son of the living God. Earth forms may deteriorate, but their living inner principles endure. You are, then, a spiritual being. You have taken upon yourself a physical body, and you animate it with your own particular grouping of life principles. You have your own consciousness, which is your source of truth. You have, in addition, a center of contact between the reality of yourself and your world life, which may, loosely speaking, be called a physical mind, an organ of control central. As a matter of fact, you are always a being. While you animate the body, it functions more or less as a unit. You think of yourself as personality, which is a relative thing. Your form points to something above and beyond itself, something that cannot wholly be confined in the form. The form is but a shadow of life entity which caused it to be. That ego alone is the constant. Having expressed in form once, it may do so again. But when it leaves, the body is just a grouping of atomic substance, which is to be broken down and put back into the universal and used again. There is not so much difference between the physical tools or body-mind tools of different men as there is difference in the way they use them. Stated as a principle, we might say that the ego builds into the physical man faculties of perception and thought capabilities far in advance of relative man's inclination to use them. The majority of men now on earth live more completely from the reflex, automatic, and instinctive parts of brain than from the higher reasoning and coordinating division. How thought functions in the brain remains a mystery. It is, however, more often considered to be an energy acting between cells than in them. Life seems to lurk in the interstices of cells as a catalytic agent in the space once thought to be empty. Substance is life's clothing. Its principles are exhibited in a form. The quality of any living thing depends on the potentials or principles contained there. These prescribe its field of action. The greater the number of primordial aspects, the greater and more extensive is the possible scope of intelligent action, which reaches the fullest development in the consciousness of a true Son of God. The chemical consistency of the physical body or form is determined by the potentials represented in that form. The spider, for instance, has a kind of knowing that belongs to spider life and form. Its tools are built into its body, and its behavior is consistent with them. It is locked in its own limitation, so to speak, it has little choice. Your body is what it is because you are fundamentally what you are. Your physical inheritance is of your race and family because the forms of life familiar to our earth are canalized, which means that they generate themselves in a continuous stream, from seed to embryo, and from embryo to child and then man. The mature man again contains a seed, and so on, down through the generations. But you are an individual too, because you are expressing to greater or lesser degree the potentials which have been developed in your ego. The chemistry of your particular physical needs must be fed in the physical, just as the ego is fed in the spiritual or invisible. A potentiality must be nourished by such elements as are in harmony with its own nature. Every living entity, then, is a grouping of primordial aspects or principles, and functions as the physical embodiment of them. The difference in the quality and quantity of the potentials provides a variety of life. 
Some things in nature live a very narrow life. Some live only a few hours. Others live hundreds of years. Everything takes to itself and knows what concerns it. All else remains unrecognized, though it may be sensed negatively or partially through the senses of their equivalent. Even a jellyfish shows response. All living things respond in some way to stimuli, each in those ways which are important to itself. Manifestation is a unity or an organism in that it is universally interactive and mutually dependent. Because of this unity and the common universal background, the knowing of any unit of life is basically intuitive. In lower creatures, where there is no knowing of ideas or creative freedom, we call it instinct. No one creature can live on earth alone and continue to exist. Earth life is relative, that is, related. Every form of life depends on some other form for its nourishment. Its power to live lies in its adaptability to the life streams of this environment. Man alone seeks law and answers. Because of his limitations, he is apt to confuse outer qualities with inner realities. The primordial aspects are not the precise detail of the form seen on earth any more than the principle of architecture are the detail of brick, stone, or wood. Probably the basic principles which operate within the universal are simpler and more fundamental something like emphasis or selection, proportion, harmony, and rhythm. The detection and interpretation of these principles in the form of idea is reserved for units of creatures who would have consciousness. The power of consciousness lies in the fact that each idea of consciousness contains within itself the entire science of its own character and nature, of its own manifestation. We know when we generate an emotion, we change the chemistry of the body, and this also applies to the thinking of the ego. By its feeling response during an act of thinking, the ego creates a special chemical result in its form. Such ideas have form, color, and light too. The word idea here may be interpreted also as force or forces. These idea forces are of the mental pole of the universal to which its physical pole is negative. The potential results are the action of this thought force as applied to universal supply. To better understand the meaning of life or livingness, one might compare the interaction of two poles of the universal, the mental pole and the physical pole, to the function of an electric battery. The poles of a battery are not separable when it is alive and functioning. The whole meaning and purpose is derived from the unity of the poles and the action between them. One cannot cut away one end and still classify it as a negative or the positive pole of a battery. It is then only an aggregate of substance which potentially may be the pole of the battery. The same is true of the interaction of two poles of the universal. Life expressed has form. Both the living principle, the positive, and the substance, the negative, are then actively united. In order for ego ideas to express on any plane, there must be an instrument corresponding to that plane. For the same reason, a creative idea, when unexpressed, is a dormant force. But when active, it is an intelligent and purposeful expression or projection of the consciousness of a being. When the will of a being moves an idea into action, and that idea or potentiality is cooperated with lay objective man, it controls matter objectively. Jesus demonstrated this principle and men called it miraculous. The results were awesome because the thought was pure and the results were true and corrective. Error is the product of mortal man. He loses the way. He does not make the effort to accommodate himself to the true self. The true self is allied with the basic principles of life. From the standpoint of these inner principles, each individual would live spontaneously and victoriously in the eternal now, having just what he requires because intuitively alive to his own truth. When we apply this principle in a practical way, we realize the potentiality an individual is master of his environment because his environment is an extension of himself and of his kind. Whatever the person has in his world, that is, of his good, belongs to him by an affinity of principles. He seeks and finds, generally speaking, his own inner aspects. Unfortunately, the power of relative mind is very great, even though it is not eternal. Wherever we devote our energies and interests, we reap our harvest. The law is inexorable. The whole process of life is an eternal appropriation of what we are in tune with, what we love, what we devote ourselves to, what we are praying for, more than what is expressed in some formula which we may be using. In this sense, a person may be lost in a false way of life, engrossed in false and temporary notions and perverted aims. When we appreciate that all beings are fundamentally so constituted that they have the power of choice and action, wherever they may be, we shall endeavor to choose for ourselves what is true and enduring. By being our true selves and helping others to be themselves, we can be of more worth in the world than any other way. We shall be helping mankind to a harvest in keeping with the truth of being. 
A great artist once said he visited the Louvre to find himself. So likewise with all men, they go about the world seeking to find themselves. Though few seem to experience self-discovery in any complete sense, nevertheless is it a development of the individual that matters. The accomplishment of a nation or race cannot exceed the sense value of its people. A few forge ahead and some lag behind. Certainly progress is not made by the subordination and discouragement of the seemingly less able. We do not condemn as inferior our lads in the first grade of school as compared to their elder brothers in high school or college. We endeavor to aid them in their development. We must acquire the same tolerance in our view of the cosmic school of life, even though the progression is not so easily observed. Neither is there any reason to suppose that the different grades of development incidental to life will entirely vanish from the earth, for then much of the interest which lies in mutual service and sympathetic understanding would disappear. If social harmony is our hope, there are a few laws to be considered. While complete equality for man is a cosmic potential, it is by no means apparent on the earth. Men differ in value, sense, and in capability. Nevertheless, the truth of the individual is a personal thing to be felt intuitively and encouraged into expression. All real aptitudes are in harmony because they consist of the primordial aspect of a single source. What each has chosen to develop is reflected in the being. This is the principle of emphasis. There is nothing accidental or haphazard about it. Any confusion is of our judgment. The form and the life will coincide with the inner principles. The only outer determinism is the earth environment as men have made it, its influence on the relative notions and habits of young children. If our history is to be something more than a ceaseless breaking down and patching up in frightful waste, we must give some thought to the kind of life we wish to have, to a bettering of the types of life which we do enter our world, and to our own individual responsibility. Universal substance is plastic to the call of living organisms and to the consciousness of being. As Dante said, Therefore, if the world today goeth astray, in you is the cause. The generation of men have a power. Each generation decides to a great extent the pattern of the one to follow, by providing the social background and by the passing down of physical characteristics. This is true whether we view it from the standpoint of physical inheritance or genetics, or whether we look at it from the longer, more cosmic viewpoint of ego grouping, the principle that like attracts like. If here on earth we choose to conduct a school of life which is elementary and confused, we cannot expect to attract advanced students. The decadence of nations may be attributed to the wanton destruction of the more fit, the more perfect in form, and often the most imaginative and independent in idea. The treachery of man to himself has been a fixed policy throughout his history. All really progressive action is of benefit to everyone concerned. No one can truly be strengthened at the expense of another. Religion has the purpose of directing the aims of the individual beyond his self-defeating absorption in the limited relative self, and of pointing them toward a realization of the eternal aspects of the soul. Such realization is possible. The ideas of an earth genius, as well as the intuitions of mystics, illustrates instances of ego thinking coming through as practical and inspiring concepts, which benefit other men because these concepts are true and a part of all men's potentiality. Individuals who have evolved in the sequence of their development to a comparable degree along those particular lines accept the ideas and understand them. Other men merely accept the results in material manifestation, such as a radio, the selfish and short-sighted may even pervert the results to destructive purposes. To achieve a better society, each must be helped to find his own good and to a greater intelligence where he is, rather than encouraged in a mad competition or running to and fro on the earth. It is the attitude that matters. Man possesses something which we have called mind. By the delicate antenna of its own communication, he is slowly evolving to a unity of action. Mind is thus seen to be a manifestation of the mental pole, the activating positive principle of the universal. Combined with it the body, the physical or negative aspect, this unit was intended as a constructive instrument of consciousness, but it is being applied to negative purposes. As we now use them, these bodies and minds deteriorate much too quickly. Not too quickly for the way in which they are used, perhaps, but too quickly for the way in which they should be used. In our myth and legends, men are said to have lived an incredible age. Whether this is true, or whether it is an intimation of our possible destiny, we know there is nothing in a human body, as it is medically understood, to limit the lifespan to so short a period. Our maladies are increasingly believed to be self-induced, racially and personally, and it is most doubtful whether a fully coordinated human body would succumb to infection. 
The personalities of our earth are in the process of evolution, an evolution of a definite order through the seed of divinity, ego consciousness, soul, intellect, body, an evolution of being. We must so familiarize ourselves with this process that we become the conscious expression of all that is inherent in our nature. This alone is the way of conscious immortality. The lesser things drop away. Jesus alone of men had attained a sufficient integration with the truth of himself to be consciously immortal. Through him poured the consciousness, which is the power that controls forces, that in turn control matter. We read, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Real consciousness is the Holy Ghost. End of chapter. Chapter 6. The Thinker Changes Things, The Art of Thinking. As all real thinking is accomplished by beings who are by nature spiritual, that is, allied with true and living forces, true ideas could not have to do with partial concepts, so real knowing is of the essence of things. The mental processes of relative man are of temporary nature. Greater part of his mental life is filled with notions of the outer qualities of things. Man, to this extent, shares in the temporary nature of all earth form life, but the different lies in his potentialities. Here is a different destiny, and through the proper use of his mind he can transform the limitation of the earth environment. Thinking is a comparatively a new art. In this objective world, few people really think in the creative sense, some scarcely at all, others only at rare intervals in the whole lifetime. Those who do we call geniuses, or the unusually able. Man's inability to express his own inner capabilities is a tragic loss to mankind. It is the reason for the seemingly slow development and progress of man as we know him. For man to grow, he must achieve such integration of self as would permit his own inner genius, his own contribution to living to come forth. This is vital to social improvement for all men, but it is particularly important for each particular soul. The relative reasoner will study laboriously to accumulate the theories and techniques of his branch of human learning. If he is a philosopher, he will build into his mind a large group of allied thoughts and ideas gathered from many sources. The subjective processes of that mind will take all this material and digest it or assimilate it and form a consistent and apparently logical philosophy pertaining to the given subject. But such an individual may be utterly unable to apply or make practical use of his philosophy in respect to his own or other men's living. While he might bask in the pride of his intellectual attainment, he is helpless to make use of the great gift insofar as the society of mankind is concerned. So why this barrier? Why can he not use this brainchild? There is a very definite reason. It is the illegitimate child of the relative levels of mind and has no livingness in it. For an idea to be real, it must have the spiritual ingredient, the eternal element. Find the philosopher, scientist, or religionist who is able to demonstrate, and I will show you a man who draws from the deep wells, not the cisterns of real thinking, one who has fellowship with realities. These lie behind the reach of the intellect. They are not a product of reason, though reason may serve them. In a higher psychology, the spiritual level of mind might be known as the master consciousness, the Christ mind. It is the mind of the ego, the light that plays around the human intellect and expresses an individual's as creative aptitudes. When, in spite of the preoccupation with materiality of its man-made vehicle, the ego overcomes the physical barriers and handicaps of the false ego unit and expresses through, we see living realities coming into focus in the objective life. When real values are assimilated by the individual, they manifest not just in psychological terms, not in a philosophy or even in a religious system, but in true living itself. Truth is to be lived, not just philosophized about. Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. In mystical language, to eat the flesh of Christ is to live by the principle of love understanding, the unifying principle of universal God, which is the former substance aspect of his reality. For material man, there is only possible when he loves Christ, the reality of himself. In this common interest or marriage of the ideals of the material man and his spiritual self, a union is established and a definite growth in solar understanding results. There is no growth for the objective man without this experience in reality, and it takes place above the realm of ordinary reasoning in a higher integration of being. To drink of the blood of Christ is to feast on the living intelligence of Christ, which is the Holy Ghost, the Christ Consciousness, which again is the animating element of the ego. Such nourishment is not the material blood of the physical man, Jesus. It is the pure, sustaining, universal element, the spiritual life principle of Christ. This blood is of immeasurable light. It is eternally real and not of transitory form. The symbol carried out means that because of what he is, man may, through his love of the Christ or ego soul principle, appropriate directly from universal substance, much as he now does in an indirect way. 
and have what he needs for this purpose where he is. A being thus illumined would never know hunger, the hunger of ordinary flesh and blood again. He would be eternally integrated with the spiritual source of his substance. He would be saved to the eternal realities of himself, saved by grace, which is a spiritual understanding of Christ. He would be born again to the one Father of all, and would be no longer a child of just a material flesh, but an earthly parent. He would be consciously immortal. The Art of Thinking To think is to move in the infinite. For man to grow he must think, for he is a thinker. What is a thinker? one who is equipped to cognize universal potentials and translate the experience into an intelligent thought form conception, thus stepping down and reducing to idea a heretofore unexperienced measure of the infinite. This is creative thinking, inspirational thinking, genius. Creative ideas, when finally expressed on earth, widen the horizons of life for all men. The spiritual ideas conceived by real thinkers contain within themselves the wisdom and power essential to their complete fulfillment on the plane of manifestation and geographically where they are intended to serve. The completed science of their being or the essentials of their taking form and being practically useful are contained within themselves. The ego thinker by means of a spiritual sensing becomes aware of the worth of the idea, of its specific value to his instrument man. Then intellectual man, by intuitive sympathy, is taught by the idea, in a moment of illumination, just how to cooperate with it in the fulfilling of its destiny on earth. The ego's idea, therefore, exhibits its character and nature before the attentive and the receptive, the intuitive intellectual thinker. In this the reasoning man becomes a servant of a real idea. So long as he remains a servant of the idea it will serve him, the whole divine process of one of relation between thinker and idea. The idea or the word would be an unrealized potential in the universal if there were no self-conscious, intelligent units to cognize it. On the other hand, the man would be helpless to express his creativity if it were not for potential ideas. The idea embodied in the word man contains the seed of all ideas and therefore the ability to think all ideas. The idea generating unit, the God-man, is the real thinker, but his ideas may be expressed through his relative counterpart, Earth-man, when that unit is sufficiently attentive and intuitive. The past of the ego life, with its attainment in thought, thus leans over the earth vehicle man to express as his innate endowment. Man, being the likeness of infinite good, possesses the potentialities of infinite goodness. The God-man made objective man in his own likeness. The seed of divinity is in man. The real man, then, is divine, a thinker of thoughts divine. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God, and that the Holy Spirit dwelleth in you. This whole spirit, this indwelling God, is the I, or the I am of man. This I is, again, the spiritual ego, the real man who is from everlasting to everlasting, and who possesses infinite potentialities. This infant giant is the child of God, better known as Emmanuel, or the indwelling Christ. And being what he is, he is endowed with the character and nature of his father and mother God, and is fed of the milk and honey, wisdom and love, which are both the thought and substance of celestial nature, which he transforms into ideas. Because of this, he is a truly intelligent being, a knowing one, Lord of his creation. He is the law by which ideas are made to manifest. The Christ man alone, then, has real intelligence for his portion. No other creation has this precise distinction. Universal substance is plastic in the hands of a thinker, but a true thinker is always a constructive builder, and all real changes are the work of thinking being. It is possible and entirely within the scope of a group of such being who have attained mastery to be a potent force in bringing constructive changes to such societies of mankind as are capable of accepting and assimilating help. But there is no coercion in real consciousness. Ultimately, only the real will endure. Other and lesser ideas, after they have outlived their usefulness, will disappear. But men are free to choose whom they shall serve. The most advanced thought of all time has arisen because of intuitive perception. Changes in things and artistic achievements arise first in idea. A great musician is great not merely because he can play well. His greatness is much deeper, much more subtle in his technical performance. While playing, the artist becomes the soul of that particular phase of understanding which is music. It is because of this that he gathers his audience into its spell. His plane is only a concentrating point which permits his listeners to slip through the mystic door and enter into union with the soul of the artist and his consciousness of music. The artist is the medium of appreciation for many who would otherwise wait ages before growing to such heights. He translates musical concepts in a manner which is inspiring to large group when they carry it beyond themselves into union with divine harmonies. 
Such an experience does not transform them into great artists. That is something they have not yet earned. But it does remind them of their possibilities. The question is, how many will follow through and achieve their unity here and make use of this understanding? So it with the intuitive spiritual thinker, he divines the truth and presents it by way of idea or demonstration. He offers his findings before men. Some are moved to awareness and a measure of appreciation. A few follow through in understanding they unite with the truth itself and stand free in that portion of their spiritual estate. Now what man has read, nor what he has learned, but what he himself has thought constitutes his gift to his fellow man. The thinker changes things. The flight of human reasoning has been retarded by the dreary load of race ideas. For man to grow, he must think independently. He must call into play those rare aptitudes which he has heretofore considered as belonging to the domain of faith. Real thinking changes things and conditions. Real thoughts are always in divine sequence. Each man's truth is his own, and he must be the one to bring it through from within. Because of the release from the old and the move into the new, each positive change brings forth a whole new release, a new light, a new measure of intelligence and faith. When these are accepted by the intellectual level of beings, the person or objective self will experience a definite move ahead. This sometimes is and should be a conscious experience. It brings new interest in the feeling of having surmounted a barrier. It gives a new self-respect and a new confidence in life. So one comes to know when the last bit of real thinking was done by recalling when there was a definite step ahead, a constructive change. With most persons, this advance is a seeming accident. What really happened was that the I and the little I, the inner and the outer, came into unity and balance, and a new measure of the real was accepted for intelligent use by the objective self. Such periods can become more frequent for those who cultivate them. Man is privileged to develop his capacity to receive in whatever direction or toward whatever group of value he chooses. The call is a devoted, intensified attention. This means also a concentration or a consecration equally as intense as a vital worry or fear. Worry is destructive meditation and is a false action or a negative movement of mind. Accomplishment is a result of a positive focalization of mind and self of the idea or aspect of life chosen. The real thinker is a builder, but he builds in consciousness first and then in form. By appreciative interest, the outer man may receive the aspect of his good, such as health. The idea to be considered here is the truth of the principle of health, the balanced well-being of the physical form. To achieve the health, the attention must be focused receptively on that idea. The intellect must sense its value, its character, and nature. Health must be deliberately chosen in love, that is, it must be taken to oneself and made one's own. Through this loving interest will grow an understanding of health, what it means and requires for the individual. Health belonging to the physical body is then made to serve the body's intended. This is thinking health, not just thinking about health. Health, like all aspects of life, is thinkable. Healing is thinkable. Achievement in a chosen profession is thinkable. Man, if he would be lifted up, may pray well for the understanding by which he becomes truly intelligent and takes his honored place beside the gods. In no other way can he reach and fulfill his destiny. End of chapter. Chapter 7. How Man May Know the Love of God When relative man, because of a deep heart hunger for real or eternal values, turns his attention to the throne of grace of spiritual truth, he enters into an experience much like that of a bee. When the bee catches a scent of the honey in the lotus blossom floating upon the surface of the pond, he becomes excited and flies towards that blossom. But if he sees his own shadow in the water and becomes afraid, hypnotized by his shadow, he may fly round and round and finally through sheer exhaustion fall into the water and be drowned. Had he for one moment forgotten himself and rested on the blossom, he would have been safe and the feast would have been his. Man likewise, searching for a source of substance and values, senses a security of eternal satisfaction. He too may become grasping and in a measure desperate. His whole aim is to satisfy his lust for possession of whatever he feels he needs. Like the bee, he may be so hypnotized by the physical self and its needs that he cannot settle down in quiet to the feast even though he needs and wants it so much. In his vain struggle he runs here and there, always grasping, expecting, and trying to make a prisoner of what he requires, not knowing that the way of the spirit is one of peace and quietness, so he, like the bee, fails. He abandons his search for truth and falls into the mire of past failures. Such is the fate of so many truth chasers. At some time each will rise and try again, for all must find the way. However, confusion is not the way of truth. The real student is spiritually purposed and becomes a learner, a child. Thus he soon is able to sit quietly at the feet of the master. 
thereby establishing an attitude of devoted attention to the indwelling Christ. He is fed upon truth. This man carries on and wins, through love, the crown of conscious immortality. This is practicing the presence. The subjective or subconscious level of the relative mind is so constituted as to take whatever is given it regardless of its value. It will assimilate and bring this material into order in such a way as to produce definite subjective states of mind. These states become the mental correlatives of the way of life including many attributes of the physical nature of the individual who possesses them. They have value according to their nature or character. If the ideas which the material mechanism of mind receives are predominantly negative or are interpreted in that way due to lack of understanding, then we have the undesirable in life. We have force intended for progressive action multiplied by a minus rather than a positive. We have the temporary rather than the true. A great philosopher once said that evil stultifies itself, defeats its own purposes. Paul anticipated this truth when he said, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we sow confusion, we shall reap confusion. If we sow love, we shall reap love. No thought is inconsequential because all manifestations lie within the universal one. The mental and physical poles are allied. The power of consciousness is everywhere reality. The idea of connection between thought, deed, and consequence sometimes has been interpreted as the karmic law of punishment and reward. It is true that every man shall bear his own burden, but the precise meaning is that sin, or the misinterpretation of a truth which first happens in the relative thought process, leads to a negative use of power and ability. It is not, however, a question of some external judges exacting a penalty. Rather, the error must be reversed or redeemed in mind to the point where a positive use of that power is possible. Otherwise, in that respect, that life is unsatisfactory from a cosmic point of view, regardless of how satisfactory it may appear. Evil methods sometimes produce material gains, but the negative mental processes which accompany these methods account to a loss of soul, so far as that individual life is concerned. The vibrations of ego mind cannot use vibrations negative to its own nature. An evil man will have failed of unity in relations with the reality of himself to the exact extent of the misuse of his power and force. Wherever there is consciousness, there is a privilege of choice, and it governs over and above the material processes of life and over substance. Man's dominion lies first in consciousness, and then in physical domain. He lives in and is sustained by truth which he has understandingly grasped. Whatever he understands he possesses, but whatever lies outside his understanding is beyond his control. For example, if during a severe storm, when I cannot see clearly, I travel five miles away from the direction of home instead of going towards it, I have missed the mark, taken a negative course, and I shall be obliged to travel back. There is nothing basically wrong with the ten miles over which I travel excepting that I have endangered my life by wasting my energies. That is the truth about all sin. Sin is a misuse of the functions of life. But the difference between the physical world and the world of consciousness is very apparent here, because consciousness, being spiritual and not bound by the material laws of time and space, may, under the right circumstance, redeem those ten miles in an instant. This is how the healing power of prayer may serve. This is a saving by grace spoken of, for grace is with the spirit. Then something happens within the being. There is a reuniting of the outer man and the inner reality, a harmonizing with the will of God. This principle is the basis of all healing. There is an illumined restoration, an action of the Holy Spirit or true consciousness. Such was the philosophy of Jesus. He declared his yoke was easy and his burden light, because he is aware that as a unit of intelligence, he was capable of expressing the will of the Father, which is a sum of the eternal truth of being. Moreover, this is the way of harmony and love, the way of all men reaching fulfillment together, rather than that of using the power of their minds to defeat themselves and others. The will of God is a way of love or unified purpose, for the realm of God is one organic whole. How, then, can man know the love of God? In any cosmology of organism, where the universe is thought of as a unified whole, an indivisible reality, rather than as consisting of empty space and isolated form, God cannot be thought of as pressed into a single idea or into a single form, but must be seen to be in and through all. No entity, separate thing, or idea can be apart from him, for he is the whole. No statement or statements possible to human thought can ever express completely the divine reality, though their principles or aspects are not unknowable to intuitive insight. But because these flashes of insight have come to so few men, and there is so great a need for depth of understanding, a wider concept of God must be emphasized than that commonly felt among men. It is necessary that they shall understand their indivisible relationship with that upon which they are dependent, 
in which they live and move and have their being. Insofar as limited human ideas are concerned, God or the infinite divine may be interpreted in many ways. These are all aspects of himself, which have been worshipped or described in religious literature. God is a source of all substance. God is a timeless source of all order, power, intelligence, and love. God is the universal good, or the basic unity, the eternal element underlying the change in creativity and forms. God is mind, not as a single mind, but as a cause of mind, which is to say, God is the father-mother, both masculine and feminine, expressing completely in egos. God is the Holy Ghost, which is the power that lies in spiritual consciousness and understanding. God is a son, wherein he achieves his greatest creation. For God is infinite, not only by reason of his own aspects and the multiplicity of creation which lies within himself as a primordial essence, but also through the creative possibilities of the units of intelligence and self-consciousness which were epitomized in Jesus Christ the sons of God and joint heirs of the kingdom. Mankind is the vehicle on earth of the sons of God, and the dominion or control which Jesus demonstrated is the truth of lives. It is contact with the underlying eternal essence of the universal, which gives real enjoyment and refreshment to contemplative natures. For God is the truth of man. Wherever intelligence appears, it may be said to be from the mental pole of the universal, and wherever form appears, it may be said to be from the physical pole of the universal. But these are interactive aspects of the whole and therefore one. To think of God as a subject apart from his creation, and to think of creation as a predicate apart from God, is a metaphysical error. So far as man is concerned, the love of God or the will of God is the livingness of God in the soul of man, the conscious expression of more and more of the divine potentials. Man does not cause God to live in him. Man, through his love of God, his yearning for realities, becomes conscious of God as living in him, as he did in the awareness of Jesus. God will live in the awareness of man as understanding, whenever man learns how to love him consciously, Jesus the man was able to demonstrate aspects of divinity by becoming the embodiment of the Christ principle. So how can man learn to love God? To think upon God is to touch God mentally. In order that this touch may be alive, active, and productive, there must be love feeling in the contact. Something of the attitude that we take when we look up into the heavens and realize the vastness of the creation. It is a feeling of merging with the whole, an attitude of selflessness. Only by knowing and experiencing the everlasting arms of something vital and real in which we live and move and have our being can we experience a realization which transforms substance conditions. The character and nature of the result will be determined, after the law of consciousness, by the nature of the idea concentrated upon, or the particular aspect of God nature which we love. God has many aspects which are principle of harmonious human feeling. For example, there are the principles of security, wisdom, peace, life, and joy. To focus one's attention lovingly upon the principle of peace is gradually to feel peaceful. After such an experience, we realize that we possess the ability to cause to become active in us anything that we are able to love. To love God is to cause the love of God, the great universal unifier, to become active in one's being. The love of God endows each one of us with the power to accomplish all things. This love, accompanied as it always is by the aspect of wisdom, is a living principle of God, having become active in the heart of the being, it clothes him in divine intelligence, the truth of all being, and makes him master of life. The living God, having become active in one person, brings into play the purifying and redeeming power of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of consciousness and understanding. So down through the ages does Christ, the true Son of God, grow in understanding and assume the full proportions of a master of Israel. To know the love of God is to be a success. No matter one's calling may be, or what the requirement, difficulty, or circumstances, what specialized knowledge is essential, they will move into a harmonious pattern for a loving soul. For men are the outer symbols or tools of units of intelligence which have emanated from the Father, and all substance is His. Such beings, when they know the love of God, are always masters, and live in the kingdom of fulfillment. Love is omnipotent, and nothing can refuse to respond to its magic touch. Men have not known this because they have not practiced love. To love God is to seek for the completion within man, on earth, the aspects of God nature which are being developed by his own inner reality or ego. By its loving interest in the eternal principles the ego grows. This is the supreme unity which man can hope for, the transfiguration of Jesus, the baptism with the Holy Ghost, the mind or consciousness of Christ are its rewards. End of chapter. Chapter 8. A New Approach to Prayer Man as we see him, the eating, breathing, dying man, is only a symbol of the real man, who is altogether spiritual. 
This objective man is the instrument on the physical plane to be refined and be made into a perfect vehicle for the Christ, the real self, the ego, to master all experiences encountered in matter or the mundane world. It is here in the mind maze of the false ego, where mental and physical emotionalism rule, the confusion is found. The carnal, mortal, or relative man endeavors to conduct himself apart from that upon which he is dependent. Here he is self-willed and self-destroying, forever searching for that experience which will give real satisfaction. He is consistently disillusioned. Consequently, life is empty and a terrifying disappointment. He feels there is no hope. He is playing with temporary ideas. Only the true can know the true. The unseen eye of unregenerated mortal mind cannot penetrate the veil of matter which separates him from his truth. Habakkuk said, God's eyes are too holy to behold evil. This false man is no concern of God's. God does not know him, and the evil one cannot know God. Only the pure in heart shall see God, that is, comprehend or fully appreciate the divine possibility which are man's own inheritance. Those who search here must leave the shadows behind. For nothing of limitation can follow the reality of man in its ascending flight through those realms of consciousness dealing with eternal values. No longer shall the blind lead the blind. There is a light for man, the road to which is waiting. Man feels a vague, distant pull to a nobler and better life. The ancient books call the way of the heart. The way of the heart is one of intuitive searching. God deals with man by way of love, not cold intellect. In the center of being, one might say, is the shrine of the Holy One, clothed in divine light and power. This is the infant Christ who has come to claim his own, that is, the attention of the objective self. While lost in world confusion, man is capable of being redeemed by the action of truth. The intellect will deal coldly with an idea, but loving thought experiences and knows its worth. The ancient depicted the heart as a center of life activity. All else received its life from the heart. So the material man needs the experience which unites him to the love principle of the universe, the principle of unity. Material ideas alone are not enough. All of this tells the story that man's spiritual sense, life precedes the mental life and carries on when and where intellect cannot reach or is of no more. Man has been told that God loves him, and this is true in the sense that God loves the real of man, the measure of himself which is divine. Man has been told to love God, but he has also been taught to deal mentally with God as a personality and to fear him. He must now be taught how to love God. To love God is to experience him. Anything less than this experience is a failure to reach him, and therefore no satisfaction. Prayer is man's mean of having conscious union with God, his source, the very life of his being. Prayer is the greatest privilege known to man. Relatively few really know what it means. Millions pray with words, but their feelings remain untouched. The few who pray with love have a living experience, rich to overflowing in values beyond the comprehension of the intellect. Technique of Prayer Man has choice. Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. To think upon a thing is to touch it mentally. Now love the object of your choice, and by love union is established. A prayer which does not appropriate directly the object of one's choice is cold, insipid, and utterly unfruitful. In the contact of mind and love lies the key to fulfillment. Intellectual approach can go only so far whereas love is limitless. It alone brings union. This prayer is the act of receiving the gifts of God, all one needs. It is a concentration of interest. In the attitude of receiving, the approach to God is one of purity. It is an impersonal love, an experience leading one to the principle, which eventually one understands. This experience is the meeting of child and father or part with part, a meeting in which the two become one. The point of fusing is the point of clear conscious knowing. Having through this union taken possession of a new unit of good, the growth stands as an eternal accomplishment. Such a prayer has nothing to do with words. It is a loving or sensing experience, an adoration, a complete losing of self in the Christ self, a real spiritual bath, a refreshment found nowhere else. The experience of true prayer affects the whole self, and when completed, man is more able in spirit, mind, and body. All growth and understanding is growth and expression or in the value of everyday livingness. Man is only intelligent where he is able to get true or real results. Only where he achieves true results has he real authority. There he has positive faith and no one can dissuade him. Such conviction is a step on the path and the individual who experiences it is true and obedient. He will spontaneously and victoriously respond to life from this point of enlightenment. Prayer is union with one's good union with Christ, made possible by the surrender of the personal will to the will of God, which is also the will of Christ. 
In this manner, man accepts the conditions of sonship step by step, and he does so understandingly and enters into the kingdom of God. What should one pray for? Whatever is essential to the individual well-being should be the object of prayer. Your needs have been anticipated. In prayer you are claiming them and accepting them. He who will learn how to accept what he needs, where he is, is master of life. He is free and is good, his good being those aspects of God which he can use where he is on the path of progress. He who prays communes with Christ in his inner life and produces good works objectively. By their fruits ye shall know them. The man who truly prays will be living an objective life of Christian victory. Prayer is finally a giving experience. Man gives that which is not his good, his problem, back to the universal by knowing it for what it is. He then turns in love, and in love gives himself to God. This loving the divine aspect is essential, as in giving the self to the sustainer of all things. The contemplative nature senses the Christ consciousness and opens the door for an inflow of the Christ nature. This inflow gives new life and strength, and the special ability each is chosen. Through the unity with the real self, you can receive only what you need and choose and appreciate. This is what the Christ is ready for you. God or your good cannot move in any other way. Love is the way. There is no other. And anything you will really love cannot refuse to enter your world and serve you. Man is a master, potentially, because of his sonship through the ego. But conscious mastery is essential to real attainment in the individual life. Whatever is received in understanding, one has the power to express. Each should accept, right where he is, the complete and perfect expression of what he has chosen for the physical person. It is where the person is that the need exists. Do not leave your choice floating around in vague space, but acknowledge and accept fulfillment where you are. This is truly intelligent living. Prayer, as understood in this way, is a livingness of the godly life and every life experience. In the godly life, one does have a faith. He has faith. He is life. He is truth. He is the way. End of chapter. End of book. This audio presentation of Conscious Immortality by James E. Dodds has been brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com and has been recorded for the exclusive use of Audio Enlightenment members only. If you have received this audio from any website other than our own, please visit our website let us know at your convenience.